Hi, I'm Laura. Hey, I'm Stefan, and you're listening to Attributed, a podcast library by Dream Data. The purpose of it is to store and share all the knowledge that we have gathered across Dream Data employees through our LinkedIn Lives, podcasts, and webinars. The typical topics you'll find here can be stuff like marketing, sales, B2B ads, operations, social selling maybe. So everybody on the call today, we're having Zoe for a chat about B2B influencer marketing. It's a topic that so little touched on B2Bs. We know a lot about that from B2Cs. We have seen a lot of videos of bags and makeup and everything else. But let's see what does it mean for B2Bs really and how can B2B start to harness it as well. Or maybe it's not for your B2B either. Zoe, Head of Marketing and RevOps Evangelism at Sventide. How do you pronounce that? This is so new for me. You just joined your roles. I know. It's so crazy. I'm really excited about it. I mean, uh, RevOps Evangelism is newer to me, but really, really passionate about the space and how RevOps connects the whole go-to-market system. And Swan Tide is a really fun company. I just got back from an onsite. I met the whole team. We hung out for a week and it was a great experience. So happy to be here. Happy to chat about influencer marketing. I think to your point, it's newer in the B2B space, but I think we're just going to see more and more of it over the next like two to five years. As somebody who's been on both sides of the influencer play, I have lots of thoughts. So exciting. Let's get going to the topic itself. So if you could define B2B influencer marketing, what is that for you? So for me, I think it's the idea of brands borrowing the audience of an individual. Like at its simplest definition, it's me saying, hey, you know, Laura, you have an audience made up of marketers and salespeople. I sell a revenue tech tool and I'm going to ask you to share about it or post about it or do an event with me or something where I get to essentially like rent your audience for a post or for a day or for an event. And then I get to put my, you know, product or something, my story, my campaign in front of your audience. And it's a different channel than, you know, maybe just like running ads on a different platform or, or something like that. It's a little bit more targeted. And yeah, I think at its simplest form, you're, you're renting someone's audience for a yeah. period of time. And we've seen that done like in a pure marketing way for B2Bs. Two companies would join their audiences for a webinar, for example, co-marketing yeah. together because we yeah. sell to similar market and so on. So now we're adding in another layer of a person joining. It's sort of like, I think of co-marketing as like mutually beneficial, like usually, you know, your company and my company, maybe we have a similar audience. Mm -hmm. And with influencer marketing, it's that, but even on like more of a micro level, it's like, I'm not reaching out to Swan Tide. I'm reaching out to Zoe at Swan Tide because Zoe's audience is who I want to talk to. Not necessarily like a company thing. I also think there's an interesting like trust dynamic that comes from an individual versus like a whole company, right? Like people know me, they know my content, maybe they trust me. And so if I were to shout out a product, if I am not, you know, crazy person or like untrustworthy, I would hopefully only shout out product products that I believe in and like, and therefore if I was recommending it to my community or network or audience, they would be like, oh, okay. Like if Zoe thinks this is legit, maybe it's worth a look. Yeah. Absolutely. What do you find the most exciting about influencer marketing? I, one, I just think it's like finally time that B2B caught up. I love like B2C brands and like all of that world. And they're usually a couple years ahead of B2B marketing. And so the fact that this trend has finally hit B2B, I'm just really interested to see the creativity it brings into our space as far as marketing. It's another channel. It's an exciting channel to leverage. And I think I'm, I'm excited to see what creators do. I think in the creator economy, in the creator age, there's so much more interesting marketing campaigns that companies can do with like a team of advisors or a bunch of influencers versus just like, again, like a, a LinkedIn ad campaign or like Google ads or, um, you know, Facebook ads or something like that. And if you were to choose an influencer to work together with, how would you look for one really? Yeah. So it would really depend on what I was selling, right? If I have, let's say I'm, I'm selling a, a sales tool, then I'm going to look for either salespeople or people with a very large sales audience. So I'm looking at like 
as I'm not necessarily looking for leaders. I'm looking mm -hmm. for uh, somebody who uses the product day in and nice. day out, which I think is sort of like a misconception. Like, I think that there is a play for the end user to be your champion more than the buyer. Because if I see, oh, like, perfect example, I was just on a call with the team over at Aligned. They're creating an entire, like, product around, like, almost like partnering with your buyer and creating a really unique buyer experience. And they're working on a campaign called get a room because they have these sales rooms that you hop into with your buyer. So they're talking to like salespeople and sales leaders and marketers, like anyone who's speaking to SERs and AEs, like that's their primary audience. Leadership is actually their secondary audience, even though leadership is their buyer. They're going after the user because they have a PLG play. So I do think it also depends on like the entry point for your product. If you have PLG, you probably want to go for users before you go for, you know, sales leaders. But if you're something like a, I'm just picking one out of a hat, like a gong, like mm -hmm. amazing product, really expensive. There isn't really a PLG play. So marketing to a salesperson probably isn't the move. You would want to talk to a sales leader or a rev ops person or whoever's actually going to be writing that check. Yeah. So then you would choose an influencer for that. Who has that audience. Yeah. Mm. And, and can build that trust. And it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who has that exact same title, but somebody who has trust and rapport with the audience you're trying to reach. And it doesn't necessarily need to be that you have a hundred thousand followers. If you have a hundred thousand followers, but they're like all over the map, that might not be as good of an investment as somebody with 10,000 followers, but 8,000 of them are your ICP. And so yeah. you want to be talking to them. So it's really just like evaluating that audience. How would you figure out that that person actually has that audience? So LinkedIn has some pretty cool tools uh, now with their analytics. It's getting better and better, but you can go into um, like your engagement now. Like I can look at a post and I can click on like the title. So I know mm -hmm. for me that 15% of my audience has the title founder or co-founder and like 20% of my audience has the title like AE, 11% has like a marketing title. So like I can see the breakdown and it's based on like how many, you know, people are engaging with that post. I don't think it's going to tell you like your entire audience, but I can look at my last five posts and get a good idea. Okay. If I had, you know, half a million impressions over the last five posts and I'm averaging about 15% founders, I can then, you know, do the math and say like, all right, 7,500 people in this are, are a founder, or maybe it's the same founder looking at it 7,500 times. I don't know. Right. So kind of a company would have to ask for proof from an influencer. Show me how does your engagement look like on each and every yeah. post or like the last two posts or something. Yeah. So I've like mm. screenshotted that data before. Yeah. I also use a, a tool occasionally. I haven't used it in a while, but called Shield, which yeah. gives some like analytics. LinkedIn is pretty careful about their API. And so they don't really like any sort of like data scraping going in and out. And they're working really hard to level up their own analytics. So I try my best to use like the analytics provided by LinkedIn, but I'll usually just like screenshot things. I, I'm working with a company right now who wanted to know like, hey, what's your average post? And they yeah. were like, what is it over the last five posts? And I, I had one post that went like semi-viral. It was like a little outside the norm. It had, you know, like 400,000 views. And that's not like my daily rate. So I took that one out and I, I did the average of the other ones. And then we picked a rate that made sense for them based on the average views that I had. But I just, I screenshot stuff. I, I try and keep my receipts and show people and tell the story with that data. I think the data is kind of meaningless if you don't know how to like tell the story with it. Um, and I think that like context and situation really matters there. Yeah. That's for 500,000 views. That's a lot. That's, that's really great. And well, it helps for the rest of the, the posts as well. And in terms of like, we've had also Nick Bennett commenting on our post right now on the event. Hi, Nick. And Hi, Nick. Nick always speaks about creators, creators, creators who are posting often on LinkedIn. If you were to choose, how would you balance the difference between a micro influencer, a smaller engagement having person, but really niche or a broader one that speaks a lot like sales or marketing or something else, who is a very well-known creator. Do you have to balance that? How would you do that? I think so. I mean, I think it makes sense to diversify. Like, would I want to have somebody who has a hundred thousand people in their audience for sure. But mm -hmm. 
I also want to look at like their engagement. If somebody has 5,000 followers and they're consistently getting, you know, a hundred likes, 50 comments, people hyper engaged with their content, Mm -hmm. that might be more meaningful to me than somebody with 150,000 followers who consistently gets like 30 likes, like their, their audience isn't super engaged. And that usually tells me like they've sort of evolved over the course of their time Mm -hmm. building a brand. And some people like their content isn't as relevant to them anymore. So I think it's really interesting picking people who niched down early and have built like a loyal community versus somebody who was just like, I'm going to speed run to 300,000 followers as fast as I can. I don't care who comes with me. And I think it really comes down to that community aspect. So I would, I would make bets on both. And then I would track the results. Like, I think one of the best things with influencer marketing is we can get into this later, but like, depending on what your CTAs are and what your goals are for the campaigns, like you can create trackability with all of it. And then I can see like, okay, person with a hundred thousand followers, like they got a lot of engagement on the post, but they only sent two people to our website. Person with 10,000 followers got a little bit of engagement, but everybody who engaged wound up on our website and we got 30 people then, you know, I'm adjusting as I go. So I think it's all about just like having that transparency, working with people, collaborating on the content. But I really love to let creators kind of do what they want, as long as there's like guidelines around like what my outcomes are that I'm looking for. This is very interesting, but let's unpack it all. So if we start with a company wants to work with an influencer, so how do I find an influencer for me? That Yeah. So I would go like, number one, I would look at where is your buyer? Where does your buyer hang out? If they're hanging out on TikTok, like I would look for TikTok influencers. If they're hanging out on LinkedIn, which a lot of B2B is, Mm. I'm not saying there's no value in like the Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter side of the world, but like LinkedIn and Twitter probably are like the heaviest in terms of B2B audience. And then I would say TikTok is is coming up third. Mm. I would also say YouTube is like kind Mm. of making a renaissance comeback right now with B2B because so many people these days are not like, we're very self-serve. When I have a question, I'm Googling, how do I, like, I did it yesterday. I was like, how do I download a CSV from Salesforce? I forgot. And I watched a quick, like 30 second YouTube video that showed me like, click here, click here, click here. Mm -hmm. And I got the information that I need. Right. So like, what if I searched the question that I have in one of these resources And then the author of an article comes up or a LinkedIn post comes up or a TikTok comes up. Like that's my influencer, the people who are answering the questions that my prospects have. And then I go and like measure their audience. So I might get 15 people with the answer, but let's say two of them have like a pretty big following and I can talk to them and find out, oh, wow, they've got like a decent following of my people. But that's how I would do it is like, I wouldn't just look at people's titles. I would actually be researching the questions that my buyer has and see who got the answers and then go by like following and everything like that. Because at the end of the day, like I could have a thousand people who like ride or die for this sales influencer, but if they're not talking about the problem that my product solves for, it's probably not the ideal audience for me to be investing cash into. Not to say that that influencer or creator isn't amazing, but when you're thinking about like ROI, I would make sure that they are speaking to the problem or able to speak to the problem. Maybe they aren't yeah. speaking to it today, but it would be like an easy pivot for them. Yeah. And if you'd find those influencers that only high level speak about your problems and does not actually answer any questions or are not relevant for your buyers. It just sounds like an ad and yeah. scroll further. It's like, Oh my gosh. Also, I saw a question here. Do you mind if I answer it? Um, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this, uh, Sergio asked, would love to know how you measure the ROI of B2B influencer marketing from a revenue standpoint. I really like this question. I'm actually trying something new and it's funny because my friend Troy is on the call but I'm using a tool called referral.io. And what I do now is like, as I'm like working with people, I can create a referral link specifically to the influencer. And I can track any and all pipeline that comes in through that through HubSpot. And then I link it back to Salesforce. So anyone who's like a quote unquote influencer that I'm working with, I actually use it myself, just like even for like partnerships and stuff, but I found it to be effective in terms of like, anyone who gets sent to me or like winds up through us through that influencer, I can track and see exactly who sent it. I also think like using UTMs is another great opportunity to see who kind of drove that traffic. So giving every influencer, depending on the CTA and and there's like a lot of different strategies here, right? Like 
some companies you could see like RetView right now. Like they've got a lot of influencers posting about their product. You actually never see them tag RetView no. until maybe like an hour or two after the post is live. Like they're not really linking to it. They're just trying to get the name out there and people end up on RetView anyway. And I think they do use UTMs on the back end, but like it just depends on what your goals are. And so I think the tracking really kind of relates to that. If you're trying to drive people to the website, a UTM is good. If you're trying to drive signups, maybe like a referral link is good. And then I also would incentivize anyone who's an influencer, because I think that is an opportunity for a partnership where mm -hmm. they're actually like, maybe you've got a rev share opportunity, or maybe you've got like a bonus opportunity where it's like, Hey, every lead you drive from this post, if it converts, we'll give you, you know, 5% of the ACV, or we'll give you, you know, a hundred dollars for every qualified opportunity that comes in. You're almost like outsourcing business development in a way and like creating more demand in the market. I love that. Cause when you start talking about influencer marketing, you think about the fluffy stuff. Somebody has seen something and then brand exposure and so on. You can talk about that at a point, especially if like it's a bigger company and use it for like, I don't know, an event or something, yeah. but, but this is, I really love that. And especially if you're figuring out how to push it back to your systems, to CRM, marketing automation, then you can build out the full customer journey. Does that influencer have a dot somewhere in the journey while selling to a specific client? Love that. Yeah. Like I want to know the value of like data and having things set up on the back end. Like it's something we just preach so heavily at Rev, uh, at Swan Tide because we like really are a RevOps solution, but being able to see all the touch points and what has influenced the deal. I'm not a big, I think attribution models like fundamentally are broken. It's like, okay, like, is it first touch? Is it last touch? Is it equal across? Like, I think every touch is influential. And if I can see that like, wow, over and over, I'm making this up, but let's say Morgan Ingram was one of our influencers. If over and over, I'm seeing that Morgan has had a play within like deals that are closing, it's like, okay, maybe I need to like double down on this. Mm -hmm. And if I'm never seeing an influencer come up at all, I have to evaluate like, is that the goal? Because there's also an opportunity for brand awareness. I think it, again, it goes back to like, are you trying to drive signups? Are you trying to try brand awareness? And I think different influencers are gonna be better for different goals. If the goal is brand awareness, then me just screenshotting my 500,000 views on this post is like 500,000 eyeballs saw mm -hmm. your brand's name we're winning, right? Mm -hmm. But if you were like, I just want to drive signups on the website, then that 500,000 views might not mean as much to you. And that's where like being really clear about your expectations with influencers or influencers being really clear about what they can do for you becomes really, really important because there's nothing more upsetting than like getting to the end of an engagement and being like, well, you didn't like drive enough leads. And it's no. like, well, we never talked about that being the goal. I love that. Um, we have another question that I will pick up a little later about B2B companies that are not SaaS. It's a different discussion as well, but I want yeah. to dig a little bit more deeper about the expectation setting. Yeah. Like before you set up a collaboration with an influencer to set up the right expectations, how would you define those? So it is aimed for success and would you choose different people? I guess I would do two things. One, I would want to think really long and hard about like how much control I do or don't want to have. I think the best partnerships are where you have like one or two sort of like expectations and then you let the creator fill in the gaps because it's going to be most authentic when the creator is creating content that they would already be creating and they just happen to introduce your tool. So I think that like that's really important. I also think picking people who actually like your tool, like I've turned down influencer opportunities because not because it was a bad tool, but because I was like, you know, I fundamentally like don't think I would use this in my day to day life or mm -hmm. don't think I would like really stand for this. Like if I would use the tool, whether or not they were paying me, that's going to be like a yes for me as an influencer. Uh -huh. If I wouldn't, unless they were paying me, I don't really want to like become a shill for like people's products. And that's not to say they're bad products, but it's like if a if a developer tool. Like yeah. something like a GitHub came to me and was like, will you promote our tool? I'd be like, that doesn't make any sense. Like I would mm -hmm. never touch this because I'm not a developer. So you want to use people who are already fans of your product or some of the companies I work with now, they gave me free trials and let me like test the product for a little bit, or they gave me a free account 
for a discounted account. And now it's like, okay, I'm a fan of this. I would use this in my day to day. I do use this in my day to day. And now I'm willing to shout it out. So I think like, that's like a step zero. Yeah. And then yes, agreeing to like, what is the CTA is the goal brand is the goal, whatever. And making that really clear as well as like when somebody posts for you, what are the parameters to make it an influencer post? So do they need to tag your company? Does it need, need to not include any other company names? I've run into that before where like oh I posted about like I was, it was one of my very first influencer like opportunities where I posted about a company and I also posted a couple other companies because it was during the like big first wave of layoffs. And this company kind of helped with like, job resources. So I posted like four or five different job resources and posted them. And like the main highlight was them, but they were like, Hey, we didn't like that because you like mentioned other companies. And so they didn't care that it got 750,000 views. They just cared that I mentioned other companies in it. And so they were like, we're not going to pay you for this. Yeah. And I just didn't know that. And that's okay. Like no hard feelings. We turned it around and I just did another one and it worked out. But I was like, I was confused by that because I was like, oh, I thought here the goal was like exposure. Mm -hmm. And for them, they had an expectation of being the only one mentioned in the post, which is totally fine. So I think it's like making those things really clear of what counts, what doesn't count, what do you want, what do you not want to see? And then finally, like, what is the CTA? Do you want me to include a link to the website? Do you want me to include a link to a demo request page? Do you want me to drive people to your LinkedIn page? Like, just being really clear about that. And I think it can change from month to month or quarter to quarter, depending on your engagement. But I think setting expectations early and often in any sort of partnership or relationship is a, a good call. What's your take on the timing and short-term and long-term collaboration? Like one post or should we do it longer? And how should that work out? I love, so one company that I'm working with right now, we're doing a three month pilot. Mm -hmm. So like, we agreed to a price for the pilot. When the pilot is over, I'm raising my rate because my rate for everything else is much higher. But for them, they were like, well, we don't want to sink all this money into you if we don't know that it's going to like drive value. And for me, I'm maybe it's like delusional, but like I'm confident enough in my content and skill set that like I know it's going to exceed their expectations. So I'm like, sure, I'll give you a discount for these first three months. And when that's over, we're going up to my like normal rate. Right. But we're doing three months because it's like that's going to be for us six posts and they're going to really get to see like what are you going to get and then i will also have more evidence to say like this is exactly what i can do for you and this is what i would like to happen so i think that is important i like that and you already mentioned a pilot of three months so it's not like a company would ask you to make one post and charge for it but it is a longer term agreement anyway trial something out work out further it could go either way. I've done one post for a company before. I like the three month pilot because then yeah. it's like, you know what? Like, I don't really love working with you or you don't yeah. really love working with me. Like we can part ways as friends, no harm, no foul. And then I just like, I appreciate the opportunity to be collaborative. If it's one post, it's like, you just get like a very tiny snapshot. You don't know if it's like, maybe we haven't found the right voice yet to talk about this product. Maybe I haven't found the right story. Maybe I'm not familiar enough with the tool to do it justice, et cetera. But like, hopefully by spending some time, like really getting to know the brand, know the stakeholders, know the goals, I can create better and better content. And that's why I like partnering with content creators because they're usually like able to come up with something really creative and interesting. It's like, here's the tool. How would you use it? How would you talk about it? Uh -huh. And then they're like, oh, I would like record a TikTok or like I would do that. Like one of my favorite people on the platform is uh, Ryan Scalera, like big fan of that guy. And Great. he's just like super creative. I, I don't know how many influencer deals or if he does any influencer deals, but I really love what he does with like his content. It's like so creative and interesting. And like if I were a brand, I would partner with him because yeah. I know he'd come up with something interesting. So I, I do think it just sort of like depends. And I think the longer pilot engagement works, but I've done one post pilots and people have said, hell yeah, let's keep working together. And I've done one post pilots where they were like, this isn't working. No worries. Yeah, exactly. Love that. Very nice. Let's shift the conversation. So 
usually we stop at the top of the hour, but since there are a couple of questions, let's pick them up. And then depending on how conversation goes, then we're going to cut this off. So there was a question from Razwan. I really like that because we spoke a lot about B2B SaaS right now, PLG and all those kind of words. But how about strategies for other types of B2Bs? Now we're talking outsourcing company. Would it make sense? Okay, so the company... The company is an outsourcing firm and they want to partner with an influencer to talk about their mm -hmm. service. Is that the question? Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think like, I think it makes sense if that person is your ICP. I think in that specific instance, like if you let's, let's pretend you're an outsourcing company for maybe you're a, maybe you're a marketing agency, then partnering with somebody like me, who's a solo marketer, who's head of marketing at a company who's trying to do 900 things with a budget of $7 and a paperclip, like an outsourcing agency would make a ton of sense for me to use. And I think there's an opportunity to say like, Hey, we're going to give you like a discounted rate for this month. Let's like collaborate on a couple projects together. If you like the service as like a, like, thank you or whatever, would you post about us? Or like I've done stuff with a company before that where they're like, we're going to give you a month free of our, of our service. If nice. you write one post for us and I said, only if I like the quality of work and they agreed and we did it and it worked fine. That was, I don't know, a couple months ago, yeah. but it's like, you have to come to an agreement that makes sense. I do think with services, it makes a lot more sense to partner with your ICP because then like the decision maker, there is no PLG play with mm -hmm. services in the same way. So I do think that like focusing on the person who would be your buyer or your decision maker and partnering with somebody who can say, Hey, I had a great experience working with XYZ team. I don't think it's as common, but I think it, it should be. I think it's like an untapped opportunity for services businesses. Very likely. And I think actually for those type of businesses, you definitely have to niche in what type of consulting you're doing for outsourcing. So outsourcing companies, you must be selling like either tech outsourcing or marketing agencies so if that person that you're choosing is talking with about tech about some specific like security or something like yeah. that it's so much easier absolutely i i think it's like it all comes down to the collaboration and the story that you want to tell and i think regardless of the product or service you're always selling the outcome i was mm -hmm. listening to a podcast recently with alex hormozzi and he talks about he's like Airlines aren't selling the plane seat, they're selling Hawaii. And so I think like you have to partner with an influencer to sell Hawaii, even if you're an airline. And that's like, that's why people literally do these like influencer deals with airlines and hotels and yeah. then film videos of them, like having this experience and like where they ended up and like what they got to do in the town. Like, yeah. it's not about just the like hotel. I, I mean, uh, my friend Vin recently did a collaboration with a hotel in like Philadelphia or something like that. And it was just that he was talking about like Philly and like how fun it was to be in the city. And he mentioned the hotel and showed the room, but that was not like, he wasn't like, here's the bed, here's the coffee maker, here's mm -hmm. the couch. It's very comfy. You know, like you're there for the benefit, not like the nitty gritty of how you got there. That is so important because if you're selling Hawaii, not a seat, the same goes for B2B SaaS companies, you're selling the solution to that problem and people love to watch how you solve it. So if you either screenshot or tell anybody, this is how I save five hours a week. And yeah. I did this with this tool, but it's my more or less like, oh, by the way, rather than. Yeah. Ask. If I were to like get on a post and be like, this tool does this thing and like just started feature dumping on yeah. people no one really cares because it's la it lacks context. Mm -hmm. But if I'm like, hey, this tool has saved my life on a number of occasions. Like here's here was the problem. Here's where I got to now. This tool helped me like close the gap or shrink mm -hmm. that delta. And like mm -hmm. that is interesting. Like I think about when I'm writing copy or like working on stuff with our sales team, like we we sell a really interesting like solution in the rev up space that has consistently just been solved by consultants. And now we have like an automated tool that does it faster and cheaper, but I'm not saying, Hey, we're selling you an automation that sets up Salesforce. I'm saying, yeah. what if you could get from like startup to scale up in the click of a button? Like yeah. 
how much, how much faster could you accelerate your revenue knowing that implementing CRM increases revenue in the first 18 months? If you could have a one click Salesforce setup, would that help you hit your goals this year? Mm -hmm. People are like, probably like, as opposed to being like, and this is exactly how like the back end works. And here's like how you would set it up. And let me give you a walkthrough of like all the buttons you would click. It's like, nobody cares about that. Like I'm selling Hawaii. I'm not selling the plane seat. Cause like nobody likes sitting on a plane anyway. I've, I've never been like, wow, I cannot wait to get on this Delta flight and sit for six <laughs> hours. It's going to be awesome. I'm excited to get to Iceland. I'm excited to get to San Francisco or New York or something like that. So I think just like fundamentally B2B and just any sort of influencer marketing play is connecting with your influencer and making sure they know what the Hawaii is for yeah. your company so that that's the story they're telling, not, you know, the plane ride. Love that. I have last question that yeah. goes back to advisor versus influencer. Yeah. What's the difference? So in my limited experience as an influencer, you're less involved in the product. So like I have influencer deals and advisor deals. I advise mm -hmm. four companies now, one I'm announcing next week, and I have influencer deals with five companies. Mm -hmm. And the difference is I just like use the product and post about the influencer deals. Um, and occasionally I'll check in with them. Like we've built relationships long enough now that they kind of trust me. And they're like, if you just like do your posts and send us the link, like neat, you know, like they don't really care anymore with the advisor roles. Like I just got off a call with a company that I advise and it's like once a month or once a quarter, depending on the company I get on and we talk about campaigns. We talk about product. Like one of the companies I advise and I, I want to make a distinction between like advising and like strategic advising. Yeah. I'm not at a level where like me being a strategic advisor makes a ton of sense, whether that's the title or not. When you're looking at somebody like if Amy Volas or Sam McKenna, yeah. they've got years and years of experience. They're like strategic leaders. That type of advising is very different than me being like a LinkedIn influencer. Yeah. And really what I bring is like my limited level of expertise. Like maybe I'm their ideal persona. So I'm advising on the product. Or maybe I'm advising on a specific campaign because I'm like kind of decent at LinkedIn. Or maybe I'm I'm collaborating with them on like a blog post because I'm a writer. So it's like I'm giving very specific like one-off advice about mm -hmm. really specific things as opposed to like overarching go-to-market strategy. Like I'm tackling one part of the go-to-market strategy and offering my help there. Um, whereas like as an influencer, I'm not given any advice about anything. I'm just shouting out the product and people are renting my audience for the yeah. most. Yeah. All right. Is there anything that we forgot to mention today that is really important? I think like whether or not you are an influencer or a company managing influencers, like staying on top of those relationships and staying organized, like I wrote about it earlier, regardless of the tool that you use, it's been really, really helpful for me to stay organized, like with a content calendar, with like a relationship index of like who I'm working with, how frequently I post about it. When am I post? Like, I don't want to post for two different companies in the same day. I also don't want to like, I don't know, farm out my audience yeah. for other companies. So like, yeah. I'm careful about, you know, like there was at one point in time, I think I was working with 10 companies Ooh. and I was like, this is not great. Like I don't want a third of my content every month to just be companies. So now I'm more selective about it and I'm a lot tighter, but, and I also like charge more with those like agreements. But it's because like I'm protective of my community and I don't want to just like be a sellout. So I think whatever you're doing, like stay organized, stay true to like your brand and your audience. People will want to work with you if you have like a distinct point of view. The other thing is just like be be collaborative, you know, I like make sure that you are understanding the expectations of the other party, because that's going to make for like a long, happy working relationship with no. those companies. No. Love that. Absolutely. And if you're staying organized, then it's much easier for the company to work with you because you can present all the results that you have done as well. So, it's oh, yeah. I have a swipe file of like, and that way, like when other companies reach out to me and they're like, why do you charge XYZ? I'm like, well, because these are the results that I get. And if I were, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's another reason I'm starting to diversify my like platforms. Like I was solely on LinkedIn up until this year. And I started a TikTok and a YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago. 
And I'm really excited because I think, and I'm about to start a podcast because like, I think it's just like other mediums for me to share similar ideas and like, just talk about the experience that I have. And I also think it's like other opportunities for companies to get in front of different audiences. At the end of the day, like I don't charge for any of my content. Like I'm never going to make a course. I'm never going to write an ebook that I charge for. Like, and there's nothing wrong with those things, by the way, I just don't ever have intention of doing that. And so a way for me to level up the content that I create and create a higher volume of it, taking on influencer deals and sponsorships and partnerships in that way. Like I just reinvest it into my content. Like yeah. basically every dollar I've made from that goes into like, Oh, I upgraded my camera. Oh, I upgraded my ring light. So like I can just provide better content yeah. for my community. And I think like when you think about it that way, like for the love of creating content, for the love of the topic, you're going to create better influencer relationships because then it's not so like transactional. It's not so about the money it's really about like who you're helping and can we help people in a meaningful way together. This is the way of collaborations. I really love how into that you are. It's, it is not a transaction. That's the thing. So you're not just hiring me for one and you're getting something else at the end, but that's where I think also the advisory thing anyway, touches a little bit on the influencer work because they will see what good looks like and maybe then they will like your advice on something else. Absolutely. I mean, I think that there are companies who liked my content before they ever brought me on as like a quote unquote advisor. And like advisory is like a whole other topic we could talk about at some point. Um, but I do think it they're both really fun and interesting experiences, especially for something like me at this point in my career. Like I'm learning so much by getting exposure to the go-to-market motion from other companies. Like I have dreams of being a really good operator someday. I'm not today, but like the more I get to touch other companies and like test frameworks that I've built at the companies that I work for, for other people and see them work or not work and why they didn't work, the more that I learn. So I think it is like a really symbiotic relationship and something super interesting. And I think, I think influencing is just like a gateway to more of those opportunities as well. Love that. Thank you yeah. so much. There are so many people cheering you for this content. <laughs> like you have inspired and Alan to talk about travel, not about Alan travel. talk about travel. I'm sure you've been a lot of places <laughs> <laughs> or Sharon says, thank you so much. This is very insightful. Everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. So it was a pleasure. I'm looking forward to meeting you face to face very soon as well or to another show that we're going to do shortly as well. That's going to be fun too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It was lovely. We hope you like listening to us. Subscribe to our podcast and the ones that we have been guests on. And if you have any feedback for us, uh, just do let us know. And should there be a guest that you think we should be talking to, then like pitch us. We're looking forward to seeing you.